let's crack the windows a little bit and I'm going to rip it. Well hey guys it's Joel, welcome back to the channel and today we've got our hands on this gorgeous 2014 Jaguar F-Type R all-wheel drive and today I'm going to give you my brutally honest opinion on it. So the F-Type is another one of those cars that really does need no introduction. It's hard to believe in fact that this iconic design has been around now for over a decade but despite that I would argue it still looks utterly fantastic. This particular example on first inspection appears to be in a fairly sedate black however on a gorgeous sunny day like today and upon closer inspection you can pick up subtle bluey purpley hints in the fleck and it is absolutely gorgeous of course the f-type is another cherished example of a car that is now no longer being made jaguar did discontinue the f-type earlier on this year and it is potentially something we're never ever going to see again which makes reviewing one of these today all that more interesting because you can and you have been able to pick up these v8 examples of f-types for well under thirty thousand pounds for some years now depending on mileage and the exact spec and condition that can range anywhere from 25 up to potentially 45 for a newer one but as far as i can see on paper that represents an extremely enticing ownership proposition so with this one being an r of course we have the wonderful largely loved amongst many five liter supercharged jaguar unit under the bonnet it's capable of putting it up about 550 ps or around 540 horsepower should be all good especially in this all-wheel drive variant for a sub four second to 60 time and a near as makes no difference 190 miles per hour top speed but the thing that in fact is going to intrigue me most today is the sound that it makes out the back we've all seen many a video on youtube of f-types with custom exhaust but even ones from stock ripping past on camera sounding absolutely thunderous and i'm expecting nothing less from this however in a fairly recent review i did in a jaguar xkr with basically the same engine the noise on that was somewhat underwhelming and i was left a little bit disappointed so i'm keeping my fingers crossed today that we're not going to encounter the same issue with this although i'll let you into a little bit of a secret obviously i've driven the car here to this filming location and i'm not disappointed <laughs> it's really really cool so the introduction of the f-type also meant the demise of the beloved xk and that was the last two plus two coupe that jaguar made however that did open up the design board to some really curvaceous sleek and sporty lines and as i mentioned at the front of the car i do think the f-type is just one of those cars that it's kind of immortal in fact if you look at the jaguar e-type which this reminds me of in many ways that's a car that we can look upon 60 years later and still appreciate its beauty and i believe that this is going to be one of those cars in a word it's timeless i particularly love on these r variants the quad exhaust setup at the back which i'm eagerly anticipating hearing and because of the shape of the car we do have a very usable electronic in this case hatchback boot at the back but my point being no matter which angle you gaze upon this car from its lines its shape its beauty is quite frankly amazing and i keep catching this paintwork at a slightly different angle and i see an ever so slightly different color so it's a big thumbs up on the exterior front but what of the inside well immediately if i'm comparing this to the xk which is the last jaguar i drove and the car that preceded this one because of the lack of two seats in the back it does feel more compact in here more sporty you're very much aware as soon as you look in front of you of the huge bonnet ahead it's very muscle car like if you've ever driven a ford mustang a camaro anything american it will remind you of that instantaneously but also if you've driven an e-type or you're coming from an xk which might be more likely it will remind you of that too it is just a hallmark of a big engined jaguar 
And the reason they were able to keep the bonnet so big, so long and so tucked in close to the engine is because, well, they had to meet some specific pedestrian safety regulations with the F-Type. When a pedestrian hits the front of your bonnet, which hopefully never happens, it can't be that they immediately hit the engine below. But Jaguar didn't want to redesign the bonnet and add a big scoop or anything like that to comply with those regulations. So instead, to keep the sleek lines and the beautiful design, they installed some airbags which will deploy in an instance of an accident or someone hitting the front of your bonnet, raising the bonnet slightly so that they're not hitting the engine. But that's how they were able to retain such a smooth, beautiful look over the front of the car. And when you look around, the next thing you'll spot is the panoramic roof, which unlike many cars is something you can actually benefit from in this. Mostly you sit sort of too far forwards to really benefit from the pan roof as a driver. But in this, from where I'm sat, I can see it in my peripheral vision when I'm driving along. And so it is really nice to have. The seats are extremely comfortable. They're very supportive. And as soon as you step into one of these generations of Jaguar Land Rover products and you see all of these seat controls, you know full well that they're extremely adjustable as well. The materials used in the interior all around for the most part are really lovely. And bear in mind this car is eight years old. It has 72,000 miles on the clock. It's in extremely good condition. Most notably of all is the stitching that still is polar white and all in good nick. I love the big grab handle that is on the passenger side here, similar to my KN actually, but it just feels and looks reassuring. And the whole cockpit is slightly, ever so slightly angled towards the driver. And you do really feel like the car wraps around you. It's a little bit difficult at times to get an impression of where the rest of the car is. There's some small door pockets on the side, which would be big enough for your wallet, your keys, your phone. Then we've got two cup holders in the middle. In this central cubby, which is slightly larger, you'll be able to store a few extra things and you'll find a couple of USBs and an AUX input there. You can happily connect your phone to this car's system via Bluetooth and play your music that way, which I have been doing, and it's all been working very, very well. In terms of behind the seats, there's not really any usable space. I'm a pretty short guy at five foot 10-ish. If you're American, that's five foot 10. And yeah, my seat's you know pretty far forwards, ultimately, and there's not really any usable space. You might be able to shove a couple of jackets down there, but it'd be a bit of a faff to get them out. There is actually hooks behind the seats for hanging your jacket. And obviously when you're stopped, you can move the seat forward and grab them, but for accessing whilst you're driving, not really usable. Much better though is this storage cubby here behind you. If I use this water bottle as reference, it's about big enough for that. So anything else that you've got that you want to hand, then that would be a good thing to use. Over this side, of course, there is a glove box, which is very generous, actually. You've got the service manual in there and a bunch of other things in this car, like a hat, and there's still room. And then looking at what's in front of me, you've got very recognizable indicator and wiper stalks if you're used to any JLR product of this time. Two lovely analog dials in front of me, a speedo indicating up to 210 miles per hour big rev counter on the right hand side with a seven or so thousand RPM red line and a pretty large steering wheel actually. If it's a minor observation I can make so far, it feels pretty big. I can't quite get a comfortable grasp on it. It's just a little bit too wide for me, but at least we have a lot of functionality on here. You can control all your volume and your menus and skipping your tracks and the mode, radio, Bluetooth, CD, etc. on this side. And over here, we've got a switch for a heated wheel, which is lovely, and cruise control. Also, there's a speed limiter, which if you ever drive in Wales, actually, where everywhere is 20 now, all the residential areas, or London, these limiters are so, so helpful. You can set the limiter to 20, 21, 22, and basically drive with your foot down. The car will not exceed that, which is particularly useful for in-town driving, whether it be London or Wales or anywhere with like a 20 or even 30 zone. Uh, Please report, we've got some really nice feeling paddles and my favorite thing of all, which is an electric steering wheel. The car's off, so it's not working right now. But I love it actually, because all of the stuff in terms of your adjustment and really controlling everything is all right here in this really small area. I mean, it's only just wider than me. I've got all my seat controls here, got my mirror controls here, which are from a Volvo like the XK. And then basically anything I'm gonna to need to control the multimedia system is here. However, this is right there. I don't even have to outstretch my arm fully to access the buttons on this control panel 
or to touch the screen because it is touch screen. So let's turn the thing on and have a little look at what we've got in here. When you do turn on the F-Type, you'll notice the air vents ceremoniously raising out the top. Here you go. Look at that. That feels very, very cool to see it are coming up on the screen there and we've got our badging just above it too. This is nice as well. We've got analog dials for our climate control air conditioning, which is lovely to see. Really reassuring, chunky knobs. You can't miss them. You can use these ones for the temperature. You can push in like Land Rover products of this era for your heated seat. This one doesn't have cooled seats. And in the middle, you can choose the intensity of the airflow. There are additional controls for your climate control inside this screen, but 99% of what you need is right here. Down below, there's a physical knob here for controlling your media. So if you just want to turn the volume up or down or your passenger wants to do so, more importantly, they can do so here. And then we've got a button for traction control, a button for the exhaust, which I just love cars that have a proper switch wheel exhaust button. You don't have to go into any specific mode. You can be in rain mode, snow mode in this car and still benefit from the exhaust sound should you wish. It's great to have cars that give you options. We've got automatic start stop on this car, which of course you can switch off if you want to, and a button just like a Porsche 911 to raise the rear spoiler, which when you do so, you get a fantastic view of it, unlike anything I've seen before. And the Jaguar badge and lettering is just right in your eye line. So there's no forgetting what it is that you're behind the wheel of when that goes up. This car has an electronic handbrake, and of course in the middle here, the eight speed gearbox. So this is the home screen of the infotainment system right here. We can click on climate and in here we can adjust exactly where the air is going. I mean flick it in auto using the button here and it will pretty much do its thing. I've not needed to use this. We have a satellite navigation system which I have to admit I've not used but like I say with any of these cars that are almost a decade old now if you use it you'll probably at least know that you're in the right country there's a screen here for connecting your phone which you'll probably want to do as soon as you get in one of these cars i did exactly that and it took me all of about 20 seconds to work out it was very very intuitive indeed on this screen we can access the audio menu through which we can switch between radio dab radio our bluetooth or other options but like i mentioned you can do that also using the mode switch here on the wheel. If we go across one, then we have some ambient lighting functions. So we can choose between five colors of ambient lighting in the car, which you're only really gonna benefit from at nighttime. We've got some cameras on this car, which you can activate, I say cameras, one reversing camera, which <laughs> it's like, you know, when a YouTube video went low properly and it's in like 240p, that's the sort of resolution we're playing with here. It does the job, but it does show its age. And this is something really cool. So in the dynamic eye page, if we pop the car into dynamic mode, which is one of our switchable modes down here, we can configure our dynamic mode to be exactly how we want. So we can set it to be the factory setup. However, that's no fun. So you can switch between having the gear shift in normal or dynamic. That just adds to the sort of ferocious nature of your upshifts and downshifts. The engine can be in dynamic or normal. Now that's more to do with your throttle response, I believe. Dynamic steering, again, the weight of the steering between dynamic and normal. And suspension we can either have in dynamic or normal. And in this particular car, the owner has it set to normal, which I think is a good choice because in dynamic, it's just a little bit firmer, but actually you'll find in your normal mode, it's kind of firm enough, but also still quite comfortable. It's really well judged actually. Once you're done configuring that, then you can go onto the stopwatch page and find out what your lap time is going to be. You can also access this G meter and also you can see how much throttle input you're putting down. I really like this actually. And that's more or less it in terms of this central system. There's no Apple CarPlay, at least that didn't come till I think when they facelifted the F-Type, maybe 2018, 2019. Same as with the Range Rovers, might be a bit later actually, more like 2020. Um, however, you can have that retrofitted should you wish. It's good that there's some physical quick access buttons on the side of the screen here. So if you just want to get to the climate control without fiddling with a touchscreen, you can press that one. If you want your parking sensors to come alive, you press that one and most importantly i think for like driving at night there's just one button here which you press it and the screen goes dim which i just prefer that like at night time these cars with all these screens you can't switch them off easily without going into the menu and fiddling around um, this just has a physical button where you can do so so i'm really 
uh, a big fan of that. The screen itself, actually, if you are using the touch, is pretty responsive. I'd go as far as to say it's more responsive than the latest JLR infotainment system. So actually, not a bad system in there whatsoever. And then very quickly though, as I touched on it before we drive, we have got this switchable area down here. So there's three modes to choose from. Dynamic, which you select by pulling this down, which as we've seen already, you can configure and tailor to how you like. Then there's a normal mode, which we're currently in. And if you push up one more time, you get rain, ice, snow mode. And what this does, from what I can tell, is essentially just reduces that throttle sensitivity by about half. And so it means it's really quite easy to drive calmly, to cruise along. I would actually probably use that if I was just commuting or bumbling along to the shop. But of course, in icy or rainy, wet conditions, it would be quite helpful as well to stop the back sliding out. Anyway, on that, I suggest we go out and take this F-Type for a drive. This is one that I'm very excited about. <laughs> This is more like it. This thing eats electric vehicles for breakfast. In fact, it doesn't just eat them, it dissects them limb by limb, watches them squirm, then it eats them. This thing sounds absolutely godly. It's thunderous. On the backfires and the overruns, it sounds like as if the devil's gargling blood. This is the fast jag that I expected when I drove that XKR. You look at the badge on the front of one of these Jaguars and you see a ferocious, terrifying, angry face of a Jaguar. And this car drives like that face looks. It's angry. Straight away, I feel right at home in this thing. I think the seating position is just fantastic straight off the bat. These seats are extremely comfortable too. You just sink into them, yet they've got a great amount of support. You don't really feel yourself being moved around on the corners, despite this thing's aggressive acceleration. And when you're cruising along, the blood gargling stops and it becomes a almightily refined thing to cruise along in. You've got this eight-speed gearbox and I can shut off the exhaust valves and it becomes just like any other luxury car really. In fact, for all I know, we could be sat in that Bentley Bentayga right in front of us. After a little while of driving, you get used to sort of where the bonnet begins and ends. It's fairly easy to place. It does feel quite wide, especially when you look in the wing mirrors and see the big hips but through the back you get a great bit of visibility and to the left and right you have those small three-quarter windows which make the blind spots fairly small. Now, I've done it again conveniently. I've ended up at my filming location right next to the Hindhead Tunnel. So I suggest we pop it into dynamic mode, make sure the valves are open. We'll crack a couple of windows. We're gonna find second gear. This thing makes me feel like a teenager again. In fact, my first car was a Vauxhall Corsa, a Corsa C. And at one point in time, it developed, well, it had a hole in the exhaust. And when you tapped the throttle around 3000 RPM, it would backfire. And I feel exactly like that with the overruns on this F-Type. It just takes me back to being a 17 year old idiot driving around in my Corsa. It's simply exhilarating when you step on the loud pedal. So it sounds fantastic then. Is it any good on the corners? Well, you'd expect it to be because it's all wheel drive and it has some serious meat in the way of tires. We've got 295 section on the rear and 255 
on the front. And to be honest, I just barreled into that roundabout, probably a little bit faster than I should have, but the car was showing no signs of struggling to hang on. This engine is just sublime too, because it really enjoys being anywhere in the rev range and it is enjoyable to drive at all times. Here we are cruising along, fourth gear, 28 miles per hour, 1500 RPM. We just tease the throttle pedal up to two grand and it surges forward with a subtle growl behind. But then if we drop it down into third gear and take it up to three and a half thousand RPM, that growl becomes a gargle. And then when we get beyond three and a half, four, five thousand RPM, you forget about the growl because you just get pinned into the back of your seat because it has this fantastic surge of power as you near to that red line. It means that whether you've got it in drive and you're pottering along on your way to Waitrose or you're taking this thing, I don't know, on track, it screams for joy no matter which scenario you put this car in. And that for me is great because it means every time you jump into your F-Type, the drive almost becomes more exciting than your destination. I get the sense that this is one of those cars that once you do arrive, you don't really want to get out of. For those of you that are wondering why the camera is switched on here, uh, you might notice on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see a GoPro. I've got a GoPro on the back of the car by the exhaust and uh, I just like to check that it's still on there. So it's quite handy I can have this. Speaking of which, so let's just give you a little bit of a demonstration of the sound. So down to first gear, we'll switch to the exhaust cam now. And that's why I put a camera on the exhaust because I have no idea how loud this thing must sound from behind there. Because even in here with all the windows closed, you get a real sense of it. So in terms of the drama, this thing, this is exactly what I was hoping for. I drove an XKR, five litre supercharged, crazy power, and it felt a little bit disappointing. It was too refined, too comfortable, too quiet and sedated for me. I wanted that Jaguar badge to, seep through into how the car felt but it was just a little bit dull might be a bit strong but this this is exactly spot on sometimes when i drive these cars i've been ever so lucky to drive many many cars now and the list of things that i've experienced only keeps growing and i sometimes look at comments of people who might not agree with me and I'll come back from filming a video and feel a little bit disappointed. I've been quite negative about the car and I just question, am I becoming desensitized? Am I ungrateful? Have I just lost touch with how good some cars really are? But then I have a day like today where I drive the F-Type and I think, no, my criticisms are correct on those other cars. There are just some cars like this that are just fabulous. The F-Type garners so many different types of appreciation from your average Joe as well, because some will look at this and think it's a thing of beauty. They wouldn't be surprised to see it pulling up to the gates of Buckingham Palace. Then others might be at a car show, hear the sound of the engine revving up and think, wow, that thing is absolutely bonkers. And so it is one of those things that wouldn't look out of place at the racetrack, wouldn't feel out of place at the racetrack, but also wouldn't feel offensive driving into Windsor Castle. It's got mass appeal, this thing, and so that's the reason why, thankfully, we get to enjoy seeing quite a few of these things on the road. And it's yet another reason why it's so sad that they're not making the F-Type anymore. Now, this might not be something you're considering or even thinking about if you're in the market for an F-Type, but it has surprised me nonetheless. Now, despite the sort of driving I've been doing today, like this, in stop start traffic in town. I've done some motorway stuff. I've done some accelerations for the camera. Despite all of that, I've averaged 25 miles per gallon today. In fact, when I was on the motorway doing 70 miles an hour on cruise control, I was averaging 39 miles per gallon. And that's just, well, it's just a bonus, isn't it? That you can run around in something like this and it's not necessarily going to cost you an arm and leg in fuel. I thought with 550 odd horsepower, this thing might be intimidating to drive but after a very short while, you get used to it. And as I mentioned, you don't really need to put your foot down all the way to get the full enjoyment of the engine. It will still growl at you nicely, even when you're just 
teasing the throttle. Having said that though, when you put your foot down, it really does pin you in the back of your seat, but you don't get the impression that you're going all that fast because of the general refinement of this thing. In fact, it is one of those cars where you have got to keep your eye on the speedometer because you could quite easily find yourself doing triple figures when you think you're doing half. Driving this thing right now though, I can't quite believe firstly how old this car is as a design, and secondly, when you look at the classifieds and see them under 30,000 pounds, it surprises me again because I just think this is an almighty amount of car for that sort of money. Yes, you don't have two seats in the back, but if you're not ferrying kids around, this is absolutely something you could use as a commuter, as a daily driver. And then again, something that you could enjoy on a trip to the south of France or even on your favorite country road. The suspension has pleasantly surprised me as well. As I mentioned, it does firm up a little bit when you choose it to do so. But in its normal mode, it's really nicely judged because you get plenty of communication and you know what's going on, but it deals with bumps and lumps and potholes and speed bumps remarkably well. I mean, it's really, really quite quite compliant. It's, it's surprised me. It's kind of ahead of its time. It feels really good. If I have a minor complaint, I, I said it earlier, it's that the wheel is a little bit too big but I was being really pernickety even when you switch the exhaust valves off still at around four and a half five thousand rpm they open but I mean I certainly don't mind that but some people might just want that to be fully quiet again if you're someone that really likes to throw your cars around you might find that this thing's actually slightly too grippy I mean like I say 295 section on the rear 255 on the front this thing's on Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires, which are fantastic. But even with all that power, because of the all wheel drive system, which is very competent, you'd struggle to get this thing breaking loose and you can turn traction control off. But even then it's very confidence inspiring. And I feel like you'd have to be going almost a ton to really start breaking loose in this thing. Of course, if you do stamp on it on a roundabout, not that I've tried this because it's not my car, but if you want to throw it into a roundabout, boot the throttle, you'll get some opposite lock action going on. But in terms of on a road like this, you come up to a corner like we have in front of me now. If I pin it round here, I mean, it just grips and grips and grips. And even when you plant your throttle halfway around the corner, it doesn't really show any signs of breaking loose. So for some, you might find it not quite playful enough, but then you've got the rear wheel drive. So that solves that problem. Every now and then I drive a car that I really struggle to criticize. And a lot of that will be because it's something that just suits me. It's something I could see myself buying and driving and something that I just enjoy. And maybe therefore I struggle to see through that and miss some obvious things that are clearly at fault. But then again, I believe that there are examples of this going way, way back in history until the present day where every now and then a car comes out and it is just perfect. And from where I'm sitting, I think the F-Type is one of those cars. In fact, another example I can think of, yes, of course, it's not without its flaws, but in terms of a driving proposition, the way it makes you feel is the L322 Range Rover. And coincidentally, the owner of this car also has an L322 Range Rover. See, he has fantastic taste. But yeah, I would genuinely go as far as to say this is just one of those cars. It's just utterly wonderful. And this is my favorite little section of road. It's like a miniature hill climb with a national speed limit, speed limit on it. So second gear, let's crack the windows a little bit and I'm gonna rip it. The brakes too are really reassuring, which is great for a car that's so front heavy. This thing with the all wheel drive system is actually over 1700 kilograms. And I suppose you can feel it, but it's just got yeah such great brakes, such a nice steering feel and buckets and buckets of grip that you don't really mind all that much. Of course, the weight comes with the carriage of the car as well. It's a big front engined cruiser with plenty of room for your luggage in the back. And especially when you look at the new BMW M5 as an example that weighs, I mean, almost a ton more than this. 
by those sorts of standards, this thing is, you know, featherweight. Even things like the cruise control are just really good. You press up and that's it, it's set and you can adjust it with these buttons here. Everything's so easily reachable. I even just like the way that when I pull a paddle into eighth, it will show eighth, but then if I'm going too slow for eighth, it will just politely change back to seven and make no fuss of it. The Meridian sound system in this is very good. I've heard better, but it's still, for 90% of people, going to suffice and some. I really am ultimately struggling here to find anything that I can say negative about this car. I really do get it with these F-types. And I think if you've not driven one, you have to. I think it will pierce an arrow straight through your heart and you won't be able to pull it out until you've driven one again. And I can see why owners and YouTubers like Sam Seen Through Glass who have had these before rave about these things because they just one of those cars that really get inside your skin. And so the only negative I can really say is that right now I'm on my way back to the owner's house to drop back off the keys. So with that sad news then, I want to thank you for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Do let me know if you have found any negatives with the F-Type that maybe I've missed out on. And of course, if you have a cool car like this, you can send me an email to hello at itsjoel.co.uk and we can organize a date for it to appear on a video. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one very, very soon.